interested in how all of you are doing. I certainly hope that you're safe and uh, your families are doing okay. And uh, it's just a real privilege for me to have a chance to speak with you for a few minutes uh, tonight. I, uh, I should tell you that um, my dad's doing well. Maybe some of you would wanna know that. Uh, I, uh, I got a chance to spend some time with him the other day. We were shooting some pictures of our um, 10 year anniversary together as a company and dad came down and we spent some time together and it was wonderful to be with him. I'm sure he would want me to wish you all well and tell you that he's doing well. Uh, I have been pensive today and the past several days, um, my heart has been thinking a lot about um, the ethos that we try to teach at this company. Um, I feel like we live in a world where cause and effect co-mingle so closely that it's tough to separate them. And uh, our mission statement to better people's lives and be a force for good in the world seems so very relevant <clears throat> at times like these. Um, I stop and ponder some of the things we've tried to share and teach over the years at ASEA, the concept of uh, how we see and treat other people. Um, I hope that maybe you can just indulge me for a few minutes tonight as I process a little bit of some of those teachings with you. I think it would be well for us to um, maybe remind ourselves of the importance of some of these things we've tried to share and teach. Maybe understanding them a little better, we can see cause and effect a little bit more clearly in our lives and in the collective lives around us in our communities and even in our nations. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the concept of humanity and the dehumanization that can so quickly happen for any number of reasons around us, where we start to see and treat each other like objects instead of like people. Many of you know that we've taught principles from the Arbinger Institute for many years uh, that was founded by a consortium of academics and philosophers, but chief amongst them was a gentleman by the name of C. Terry Warner. And um, I'll never forget reading a phrase that I had to process several times that he wrote, which was that um, it really doesn't matter uh, what we say, and it really doesn't even matter in some cases what we do. What will be most meaningful and significant um, and influential to others is how we regard them and, uh, and the way that we see them. And they're responding not to what we say, they're responding to our hearts and how we, it is that we actually regard and see them and how we feel about them and what he calls as our way of being. And at the very core of that teaching is to see one another as people. We live in a time where the dehumanization is an invitation at all levels to, to not see one another as people. It can take the shape of something as simple as being in a hurry and someone being in your way becomes dehumanized. They become an object. Uh, and it can certainly take very terrible forms as we've seen uh, around us in the world uh, these last several days and, and frankly for a long time. And I've been thinking a lot about us trying to simply do our small part as a community, those of us that are involved in ASEA and giving it our time and energy We've for 10 straight years, we've tried our very best to promote and teach principles that strengthen our sense that we need to see and treat other people as humans. In doing that, um, when we see others in their truest sense, we are true. When we see others falsely, we are false. I hope you can process that, that when we see others truly in their most true and sincere human self, real, and when we see that they matter as much as we matter, then we're true. And that sense of being true to others around you is at the core of what I think of as the invisible work. So much of the work that we do is visible. I can build a building. I can, uh, I can even build a company. Um, I can do so many things that are tangible and visible. But perhaps the most meaningful work is the invisible work. And the invisible work is the stuff that's deep inside of you that is working on you and how you see and treat yourself and how you see and treat others. 
in that process, there is a great uh, self-discovery. There's also a great invitation to uh, look at yourself carefully and try to find out what it is that maybe you might be thinking that may not be true. And so, as you can imagine, after 10 years of trying to teach some of these principles of seeing and treating other people as people, uh, it's been on my heart and mind uh, because I think we're going through an interesting time as a country here in the United States and frankly around the world. Um, and I think we're so quick to dehumanize each other. And I would just encourage all of us to remember that our influence in this world and on individuals one at a time will be largely determined by how we see and treat them as people that we should be careful to dehumanize others, uh, even people that might have different views than we do. We should be careful because sometimes uh, we're, I think we might be surprised to know that, um, that, that the law of the harvest is real. And when we are planting uh, certain seeds, we will reap that which we have sown. And I think we have a responsibility as a community and as a company to continue to promote these kinds of highly human concepts. Um, you know that we've talked about the African philosophy of Ubuntu. Couldn't be more relevant in the world than, than right now, which is I am simply because we are. None of us are an island or dislocated from one another. We have a responsibility to each other. And we understand that when someone else is hurt, that we're hurt. And our connection and commitment to each other is such that uh, we understand that we're one. And the word unity is such an interesting word. We say words like community, um, and I think we sometimes disassociate the etymological basis of that word. It's unity. It's oneness. That kind of unity and oneness is only found when we see each other as people and treat each other as people. When we take that philosophy that we've taught from many stages in this company of, of how we don't allow ourselves to process that I am because I am. Uh, we recognize and, and understand that I am because we are. And so there's an element of commitment that we have to have to each other on staying true to this ethos and what it is that we've been trying to teach for a long time. I've been processing and thinking a lot about uh, where our attention goes and our natural course of, cor uh, course of attention is always to be focused on ourselves. But there is no real clarity until our vision starts to be concerned and aware of others. This is a time when um, there are a lot of people that are scared. There are a lot of people that are going through difficult personal times. I've thought a lot about um, I was speaking to a colleague of ours who does some volunteer work, and he was telling me that uh, in some of the interviews he is doing that people are going through very, very difficult times. The social uh, restrictions are obviously forcing people to live in, in situations that are more uh, solitary. And uh, we were talking about just the, the amount of personal challenge and struggle that's going on. And at times, I think that can swallow us up when we're focused and, and looking at ourselves. But our vision is probably most blurred when we're self-concerned. And I would challenge all of us to uh, sit down quietly tonight after this call and just give some thought to people that might come to your heart and mind that are in need of a, a form of humanity that if you'll just sit still long enough, I promise you they'll come to your heart and mind. These may be people on your teams. These may be family members. These may be uh, any number of people. You might even be surprised if you sit still long enough to have a name or two that you haven't reached out to for a long time. The responsiveness to the needs of others is at the core of our ethos. And I don't think we should do so motivated by the business. I really don't. I think we should be reaching out to people on our teams with care and concern and interest in them personally. If there is a benefit of reaching out to them that happens to go towards your business, then so be it. If there's not, uh, then you've done nothing more than live this ethos of reaching out and trying to be a lift to others and being mindful of others. I think when we do that, we are most true because we're seeing people truly. We're seeing people as people. And we live in a world where on any given day, the people you interface with and are walking around every single day or interacting with on Zoom calls are going through their own custom set of challenges and difficulties in life. 
awakening the empathy in your heart to be concerned enough to show interest in others is at the very heart of our ethos as a company. To the word empathy, pathy comes from the concept of path. So empathy, M E M, with the prefix being in, we're in path or we're walking the path with them. And I find myself asking, uh, do I do enough of that throughout the day? Do I stop and consider the path that others are walking on? And ASEA is such an incredible vehicle for us to increase our empathy and be more sensitive and aware and alert to other people around us. And slowing down on the pace of play, which I think has been forced on us a lot in these last several weeks, but um, really turning our attention to those that might be in need enables something to happen to us. It's a, it's a strange irony that when we turn our attention outward, something really special happens inward. And that inward change, that invisible work starts to work on us. It starts to slow down or decrease the swelling of our own sense of self-interest and put us in a position where we can actually process and think through the needs and circumstances of someone else. When that happens, uh, there's something very enriching that comes back to you in spades and it enables you to have increased influence in the world because you are seeing people as people. I, I can't stress enough the feeling I have, which is as an organization and as a community, a calm unity, a group of oneness, that ours should be a voice uh, of, of love and concern for those around us. It should be a voice of respect. We should be reaching out across all uh, different circumstances and, and situations in life different belief sets, different ethnicities, whatever it may be, and we should see one another as people. And we should remember the truths and the teachings that we've tried to share in our corporate ethos for so long now. I hope that we're not getting so used to hearing them that they're becoming dismissive. I really do hope they become the seeds of the invisible work, which is that most important work that helps us to start thinking about ourselves. I keep this book, of course, on my desk here on my credenza. And I do that to remind myself of what these three questions are. You know, when is the best time to do something? And who is the most important one? And what's the right thing to do? And you've got to ask yourself, gosh, if ever there was a time to do something, it's now. Whether that's opening our mouths about our unique opportunity to the many, many people that are struggling for economic alternatives, whether that's opening our mouths to promote general and good health at a time when health has become so central to the discourse around the world, we've learned the fragile nature of life. We've been reminded that we're not in control of all of the circumstances and dynamics, and we have responsibility to our own health and the health of those that we love. And I think that's just created an entirely new megaphone for us to use as we try to reach out to the world with a message of hope. We obviously, and we've talked a lot about this, need to be careful. We should not exploit the dynamics in the world around us in any negative way. Um, but we should take the time to say this is a message that deserves to be shared and I'm willing to share it and take advantage of that opportunity. When you think about now being the right time and who is the most important one, it's the person that comes to mind. It's that moment I asked you to consider just hanging up the phone tonight or jumping off Zoom and saying, okay, where can I place some attention? You'll be surprised at what can come from simple moments like those. Um, there are people that are lonely, there are people that are scared, and we can have a chance to, to assure them and affirm them that, that we're mindful of them and reaching out and checking in on them. Uh, I have a neighbor I lived next to for 12 years. She and her husband uh, were uh, an elderly couple, and over 12 years, we got to know them very well. My boys would go over and help with yard work or uh, help them in their home with small chores that became more and more difficult. And we were in the home when her husband passed. We were literally there with her when he passed away. And she's become a dear friend of mine beyond that time uh, when she started to live a life of a widow. And I've, I've recently checked in on her. I check in on her pretty frequently. And I'm amazed at how much that simple act of just driving by on my way home from work. We now live in a different neighborhood, but still close by. And I think we have an opportunity and responsibility just to think about those people that could use our help. Uh, my dearest friend from many years ago lost his father to uh, the virus uh, just a, a few weeks ago. And uh, we've been processing how quickly that happened. And it was a really heavy discussion and it's been several discussions with him and text messages where I've been able to really understand. And um, 
what he's going through. And I thought it was so amazing. He texted me and um, he talked about the loneliness of his mother who had lost her beloved husband. And he said to me, I know what I'm gonna do when I get back home. He was out of state there to support his mother at the time of his dad's passing. And he said, I'm gonna seek out the lonely because watching my mom just in these early days of this change in her life after almost, I think, 60 years of marriage, he knows that there are people all around him at all times. And he said, there's a need to seek out those that are lonely. So I'm sensitive tonight about the world and what's going on around us. And I think we have a responsibility to really take seriously this invisible work inside of us. The work that's tough to see, I can see your ranks, I can see your commissions, I can see if you've qualified for an event. But the invisible work is what I've really been focused on here for 10 years. I want you to know that I focus on it in myself. I'm not asking or suggesting something out of you that I don't genuinely reflect on personally on a frequent basis understanding and realizing that I could do more and be more in service of others and that I can do better at trying my best to live the ethos of this company. As you do that and then begin to process the priorities and hopes and aspirations you have as it relates to this business, something very special can happen. But if you reverse the prioritization to just the business and you don't make that invisible work of your character and how your motives are being managed and why you do what you do, your focus on the right time being now, the most important one is the one you're with, and the most important thing to do is to do good for the person by your side. If these truths don't start to permeate that invisible work and inform it, I believe we have an opportunity to be a corporation without a soul, which is why for so long I've talked about the corporate soul and the ethos of this company. It has to be inspired by that invisible work, the work that only you know that you can do. And when you explore the frontiers of that invisible work, and start to prioritize what it is I need to do to actually change, improve, uh, shift a mindset, see others as people and not treat them as objects, whatever that may be for you. When you couple that with the aspirations and intentions of building a business here at ASEA is when the magic of our ethos, opportunity and product set all come together because you're doing it the way we've always intended. If strategy is differentiation, if strategy is says, how are you in fact different than someone else? then that kind of commitment, that kind of an approach becomes strategic because it's what makes us different. It, it's what sets us apart. And gosh, I hope that can resonate with you at a time like this, that we're stopping and pondering and processing what is and where does the ethos live? What is the cause and effect of what's happening around us? How much of this is a reflection of a lack of focus on the invisible work of the one? How much of that focus on the one, which then inspires an outward concern for others, reminding ourselves that our vision is most blurred when we are focused on ourselves. And when we can pull ourselves out of that place and start to focus on other people, uh, you'll be amazed at the natural degree of interest, curiosity, and influence that emerges from that reality because people will sense the trueness of your approach to them. You're seeing them as people, treating them as people, their lives matter, their fears are real, their hopes are real, their desires are real, and they're real enough to you that you're willing to meet them there at that realness. And that makes you real to them. And that's very, very difficult to fake. If you try to fake that, people can tell it very quickly. It's cosmetic and quick. But when it's real, it inspires a form of curiosity and intrigue because people aren't seeing it. They're not finding it right now. The discourse is coarse, right? We live in a world where civility is in decline, which is one of the core principles I hope to inspire in any world environment we find ourselves. We should see and treat each other with kindness and respect and be careful with how we do that. I hope you'll forgive me tonight if this feels uh, maybe a little hyper ethos discussion, but it certainly seems relevant with all that's going on around us in the world. I do wanna pivot on a couple other thoughts. I've shared many times on this particular call with Karen individually and several other groups that I received great counsel from a mentor earlier in my career. I had just been made a senior vice president of a large company. I was in my early to mid thirties. And to be honest, I was, uh, I was really scared about the job I had. I didn't necessarily feel like I was equal to the task. And this great mentor walked into my office, knocked on the door and came in and said, uh, can I give you a piece of advice? And I said, yes. And he said, don't take counsel from fear. And it was quiet. 
And I looked at him and he said, don't take counsel from fear. Not a great counselor. Um, we live in a time where we should be inspiring hope. We should be countering messages of fear and we should be inspiring hope. I have a highly optimistic view of the future of the world, of this company, of all of our opportunities. And I think we need to inspire that in other people. Taking counsel from fear disintegrates hope and faith and confidence in the future and can paralyze you or people around you. I think we shouldn't be a voice of fear, nor do I think we should take counsel ourselves from it. I think we should be leaning into the future, realizing that these elements of humanity that so inspire me and us as a company are everywhere and the goodness is everywhere. And so I think we should be a voice of strength and confidence and hope. Let me be clear, ASEA is really strong right now. We're in a very, very good place as a company as a whole. We made a deep abiding commitment, which we are grateful to this point that we have been able to keep, which is we did not want any of our employees to be let go during this uncertain time. And we continue to maintain a posture to that effect. And we've made changes and commitments to the company to be able to do that as long as we can. And at this point, we believe that has the ability to ride out this entire storm. In that same spirit, the company is strong financially. We're amazed and I'm almost humbled and even a little bit guilty that I know so many other companies are going through difficult times, small businesses across this country and the world, long-standing businesses, decade-long, second and third generation businesses are struggling to stay alive and many have closed their doors. For us to be where we are is a testament to your leadership. We are in a very, very good position as a company. I'm thankful for the executives of this company that are working really, really hard around the clock to solve real world, real time challenges, but also to respond to the increased demand and need for our product around the world for the very obvious reasons we all know about. And they've done so with grace and with incredible commitment. It's inspiring to watch, to see people coming in here and doing their jobs in otherwise very difficult times. I'm equally inspired. I was on a call with Europeans. I had 180 people on a call, most from Hungary over this past weekend with one of our great new diamonds over there. And I was just inspired by the eyes and faces of the people and their commitment, their energy, their enthusiasm. I can feel it. There's a sense of hope and confidence in all of their faces. And I sense and feel that from all of you as well. And so I'm thankful for that. We are in a really, really good spot as a company. And I'm speaking to you tonight, as you can tell entirely from my heart. I don't have PowerPoint slides or updates for you, but I can tell you we're strong. Uh, I certainly wouldn't say that if we weren't but we are, and we're in a good spot as a company. I feel like we're in a really, really interesting place to be able to help the world in so many different ways. When I was a young man, uh, perhaps the, the most influential person, definitely a top uh, few uh, uh, the, of the most influential people in my life was my brother, John. Um, John began to collect quotes at, at, a, at a young age, he started to build a book uh, that's become kind of a family classic of ours of quotes and inspirational thoughts and poems. He would, um, he, he's always had incredible penmanship and he would write these poems out and he started to collect them over time. When I was a young man and was going out into the world, he, uh, he and challenged me to, to read The Greatest Salesman in the World by Og Mandino and particularly talked to me about the scroll that talks about greeting this day with love in my heart. If you've read that book, you know that, uh, and I have a few of these lines here, I have long since not been able to remember all of it, but I've been thinking a lot about this powerful uh, scroll. You know, there were several scrolls in the book that, are, uh, that he's reading at the end. And one of the scrolls is called scroll two, which says, I will greet this day with love in my heart. Um, and I find it fascinating as I think about uh, all of the different challenges we have in the world right now. I don't think there's a more important mo uh, moment or message for us to be saying, I will greet this day with love in my heart. And some of the comments, I'm just going to share a few of them looking on my other screen here. Um, he says, I will greet this day with love in my heart. And, and how will I speak? I will laud mine enemies. They will become my friends. I will encourage my friends and they will become my brothers. Uh, I will always will I dig for reasons to applaud. Never will I scratch for excuses to gossip. Uh, when I'm tempted to criticize, I'll bite my tongue. When I'm moved to praise, I will shout from the rooftops. Uh, it's not that the birds, the wind, the sea, and all of nature speaks with the music of praise. Do they not all speak with that praise? Uh, 
can I not speak with that same music to my brothers and sisters? Henceforth, I will remember this secret and it will change my life. I will greet this day with love in my heart. Uh, can you imagine the influence of an older brother when I was a teenager sharing words like that with me and challenging me to commit them to memory? He had committed them to memory. Uh, his influence is immeasurable in my life. And I was thinking today about the power of that simple concept. I will greet this day with love in my heart. I will avoid criticism. I will laud mine enemies and they will become my friends. I will applaud my friends and they will become my brothers. I think we have a responsibility to try to live that way now. Um, several years ago, uh, a dear uh, friend in the field sent this to me after I had given the ethos presentation as a comprehensive presentation for the first time in 2015. And uh, as I was thinking about this call tonight, I looked over on my, uh, my desk over here to the side in my office and I walked over and just stared at this for several minutes as I pondered kind of pensively the world we're in and the importance of these messages. And I would just challenge all of you to give some time and thought to the ethos we have as a company how does that inform and influence the way you're interacting on a local level, on a global level, and what your thoughts and feelings are and how we might be able to inspire this in other people. Let's awaken humanity. Let's focus on the invisible work, the stuff that's inside of us that really only we know. And we've been trying to inspire that kind of introspective kind of self audit for a long time. And we felt so strongly that if we could inspire people to look at themselves that way, with an eye towards constructive self-criticism to where I might be able to do more invisible work so that my influence becomes visible. Uh, I just, I feel so strongly about it now. The world needs us and needs this mission and needs this ethos more than ever before. The world needs this product and this opportunity more than ever before. And the world needs you more than ever before. Do not take counsel from fear. This is not a time for us to shrink. This is a time for us to expand and to be the people that we've always been trying to be and realize that there's a stage right now in the world that's starving for unity, for those that were willing to greet this day with love in their heart and treat other people like people, increased civility, kindness, humility, uh, all of which I think is at the heart of where we need to go as a company and where we need to go as a people to strengthen ourselves at a very difficult time. Please take seriously this concept of just sitting quietly for a minute and processing who can you reach to, to inspire them and be mindful of them. I hope if you'll do that and respond to that, you'll be amazed. You'll, you'll have literal miracles happen as you reach out to others and sit still long enough to say, who can I reach out to, to try to lift, inspire. You all know my favorite quote, right? Uh, that service is the virtue that distinguishes the great people of all time. And it is the virtue by which they will be remembered. It places a great mark of nobility upon its disciples. And it is the dividing line, service is the dividing line between the two great groups of the world. Those who help and those who hinder, those who lift and those who lean, those who contribute and those who only consume. How much better it is to give than to receive for service in any form is both comely and beautiful. To show interest, to impart sympathy, to build self-confidence, to banish fear, to awaken hope in the hearts of others. In short, to love them and to show it is to render the most precious of service. That has long been my favorite quote. It's one that I think of often. I pray that there hope that we can be the kind of people that will lift and not lean, contribute and not consume, that will help and not hinder at times like these where unity and goodness and our ability to see other people as people is really the hallmark of who we are as a company. So guys, let's remember that we've got lots to be thankful for. Life is, is moving forward, the company's moving forward. I'm so thankful for all of you and your willingness to let me share a message from my heart tonight. I, I'm clearly speaking from my heart to all of you. We need to be that type of people that others look at and say, there's something unique about ASEA. I'd like to be a part of that. Let's do it by being genuine, seeing other people as people. And as we do that, I think we'll be most true and real in our own lives. Karen, I'm thankful to be with you. I'm looking at the clock and realizing it's probably uh, coming time for me to wrap up, but um, what a treat for me to be able to share a few thoughts with all of you. I hope 
you'll forgive the, the heavy ethos nature of my message tonight, but it's something I think is relevant and needed. Let's continue to go out and share what we've got and let's try to help other people in times of need. I think that's what we're all about as a company. Karen, thanks a lot. Thank you, Tyler. And on that note, uh, we at the home office wish you all a safe and healthy week until we get together again. Thank you so much, Tyler.